Oh, they're totally awesome. Now you have the original. Damn. Yeah, it's pretty good, right? <laughs> nice guitar. Yeah, let me go up there and try it out. I remember I was at ESP once and there was a guy, uh, they'd gotten a call from some guy that was uh, called the warranty department and wanted, um, needed some, uh, wanted to send his guitar back because he'd gotten the guitar and, uh, and he welded all these sh uh, shut. Oh, wow. And because he didn't know anything about it, he didn't know that they were, you know, it's supposed to move. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He goes, okay, it's right in tune. So if I weld these shut, it'll always be in tune. Yeah. 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 And he wanted to send the guitar back because he went out of tune after he welded his tuning pegs. Nice, nice. Right. So we've actually had guitars come into the repair shop where you can tell that guys have made marks uh, where the tuning machines are supposed to go on the neck, and uh, Whoa. they don't understand why it's not going to stay in tune. But, yeah, you know, yeah. Future, future luthiers in America. <laughs> yeah, that's <everything>. right. <laughs> Uh, well, I, first of all, I want to thank you for coming here, and I want to thank you for taking the time to do this interview with me. Uh, really, I'm just a fan. I've been a humongous fan of yours. Uh, think about the time the first Lynch Mob album came out was when I really started playing guitar and getting interested in guitar. And uh, well, that album was awesome, and, and subsequently everything that you've done after I followed and, and been a big fan of. And uh, well, there was that one note, though. Yeah, well, yeah. everybody's got that, that one note, but you know. But other than that, uh, it's been pretty awesome. And, and uh, I've actually met you a couple times uh, over the years. You probably meet a lot of people, so you don't remember. But uh, years ago, I met you in a hotel in Meridian, Mississippi, and you were there for PV, I think working on some amps or designing mm -hmm. an amp or something with oh, them. Okay. And uh, shortly after that, uh, we did a clinic together at a store in Baltimore uh, when I think you were doing a, a PV clinic tour kind of thing. So I've met you a couple times over the years, and you were actually here uh, once before uh, for a big event that we had. So it's been awesome to have you uh, kind of go along my musical journey, you know, together with you as a fan. I do remember the, the, the PV trip. I don't remember meeting, but um, yeah, I remember Meridian, Mississippi, because it's kind of stuck out in my memory because it was sort of an odd kind of destination, you know. I thought, it is. Oh, <laughs> and I'm sort of the, I'd never even heard of it before, and then found out a little bit about it and really the town sort of exists for like two things because it's the headquarters of PD and there's a lot of prisons. Yeah, there, there you go. <laughs> and I also found out a lot of the prisoners work for PD. Uh, yeah, well, you get your labor where you can, that's... Uh, well, yeah, but <laughs> I, prefer, but I don't think having slaves do your, you know, working in a for-profit corporation is, is the right thing to do, but uh, uh, they'll do it if they can get away with it, which they were, and I found out about that or I had knowledge of that. And uh, uh, there came a point in uh, our discussions where they wanted me to sign a non-disclosure statement uh, that I promised never to reveal the fact that they used prison labor to build their amps. Wow. Well, I didn't sign it. Uh, clearly. So yeah. I'm talking about <laughs> yeah, it. Clearly. I feel like Stormy Daniels right now. I don't yeah. know why. <laughs> wow, that's interesting. Okay. Um, so what? Do yeah, you, we're 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 PV. We don't use Chinese prison labor. <laughs> yeah. We use American yeah. prison labor. Goddamn. It's much cheaper that way. Yeah. There's no shipping involved. <laughs> <Praise the Lord. laughs> so what are you working on these days? I mean, uh, kind of catching up to see what you're up to these days. You're involved in a ton of different projects, and, and you seem to stay really busy, like me. Um, so what what are your major things that you're working on these days? And, and you know, kind of what are your goals right now, musically and personally? Well, we got this new. Uh, ESP Comi 4 out, uh, LTD actually, LTD Comi 4, which I, this is the first time I've had one of these uh, that I played one, uh, the new one, and it's it's phenomenal. I mean, honestly, I think this the neck on this is nicer than the old one, than the original. It, it feels um, great. I love the unfinished maple I feel. Just think to I think I remember mine had had uh, scallops, scallops, up there? scallops on. I thought. Okay. I can't remember, but. Anyways. Do you still have the original guitar? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. How many guitars do you have, would you say? Um, more than any one person really needs, and it's actually kind of sinful, I think. <laughs> and uh, I think I need to divest myself of some of the excessive guitars that I own and give them to people that need them. 
So I, I brought a bunch back to ESP and just sort of like, let's do a campaign where we like find kids, you know, that need guitars that don't have guitars, you know? Yeah. You can't afford them. I remember, we all remember when we were kids, you know? It's like having even one guitar was like a big deal yeah, to be able to afford yeah. it. Yeah. And like my first guitar was like, I worked all summer mowing lawns. My dad matched me dollar for dollar, and then we finally found one in the, the little, you know, Trader magazine or something, the newspaper, and found one. And it was like eighty bucks. <laughs> what, a what, 1960 Les Paul Special, along with a blackface Fender Tremolux amplifier, 210 uh, piggyback amplifier, 1963. Uh, and a 1960 Les Paul Special, both for $80. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And I had $40 saved from doing chores all, all through the summer, and uh, my dad met, met, matched me dollar for dollar, so I got... That's yeah. pretty awesome. That's actually but an I awesome mean, rig to start with, really, you know. <laughs> right? You think, well, I had some <laughs> other stuff that wasn't so great before that. I had Tisco's and St. George's and K's and stuff. But uh, that was my first real guitar rig. And uh, But I remember back and was like, I never needed anything but that. I made that work. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And then, uh, of course, now I look in my house and I'm like, I'll never play any of these things. So it's like ludicrous, really. It's not a contest, and so well, like, you know. I feel like in some ways, when I, I think I have 36 guitars at home, and that's a lot. Like you're right. Like some of them I never play. I don't open out of the case. You know, maybe once a year I look at them or something like that. But uh, over the time that I've had a lot of them, sometimes I've played, you know, this guitar for this project, or this is special because, I don't know, my wife got it for me, or, or something like that, and I have these emotional attachments to these guitars, and although I don't play them, there's just something to me that feels awesome about having them. And I totally get what you're saying. I'm, I'm never going to use a lot of them. I should give them to somebody that needs them or, you know, do something well, I'm not with them. But, but, you know, I mean, I... I uh, if you feel guilty, then you can do that. <laughs> you're right making now. me feel guilty. I didn't say <laughs> I was talking about me. I was <laughs> um, well, how many guitars did Hendrix own in, his, in 1968? 67. Not that many, you know? I, I think mean, he had, like, one or two main ones when he first yeah. started out. Yeah. And that was enough. He did a lot of good things with just that one, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, I think in today's world, we're a little bit spoiled because there's so many products out there on the market. There's always new guitars coming out. As musicians, we're always chasing a tone, and, uh, you know, everybody is always kind of having their mind, well, if I just get this guitar, if I just get this piece of gear, I'm going to sound like that Lynch Mob record if I could just get that guitar. And, you know, I get that guitar and I still won't. sound like me. And I can't guarantee. sound exactly like you. It's just how, you know. My tech was, we were just talking about that dinner last night. John, my tech, he was like, he goes, uh, you know, he plays through my rig every day. And he's like, I sound completely different than you do. Because, you know, I'm, like I've sat in a room, you know, with great guitar players, you know, like that guys like Eddie and stuff, or Lukather, or, you know, just monster players. And they just... They just play like that, yeah. you know. Yeah. It's just them and their inflections and the tone of their hands and mm -hmm. how they mute the strings and, and every little thing. But mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I get what you're saying though, and I agree that um, if you're doing, if you you know, if you're a musician as a profession and you're doing a lot of stuff, like you're doing studio work and you're doing outside work and you have multiple projects and you know, across multiple genres and maybe movie trailers or whatever, you know, you you, you, you need you, these tools. Yeah. yeah, they're tools that are yeah. in the palette, you know, just for color, colors of paint, and yeah. you need a uh, strat, and, and you need a Les Paul, and you need a 12 string, and you need an acoustic, and you need a. A telly, and a jumbo body, yeah, and everything. a classical yeah. guitar. Yeah, I mean, and a, maybe you, know. <laughs> you need a slide, you need something set up for slide, maybe yeah. you need a, a Dobro or National Steel, um, maybe a Coral Sitar. <laughs> Maybe something kind of lo-fi, you know, Italian resonator mm -hmm. guitar or something. And the same goes with amps. You need oh, yeah. a few different flavors. That's right. Um, <laughs> but maybe six to ten of each. That's not too many. So maybe there should be a lot. Yeah. We'll have to work with yeah, that. So it's like we should be like the Bernie Sanders of inequality for tone. There you go. Right? <laughs> raise the floor and, what was it called? Raise the floor and lower the ceiling. <laughs> Because if there is a, if there is if sin exists, I think it's having too much. Yeah. I think that because for somebody to have too much of anything, I mean, other people else doesn't have enough. Right. Yeah. Um, while we're talking about guitars, tell me a little bit about your relationship with ESP. You are 
uh, definitely their flagship endorser. You've been with them uh, for a really long time, and uh, over the years, I've seen a lot of different ESP models that you've come out with. Uh, tell me a little bit about your relationship and, and um, why you've stuck with ESP so long. Well, I think almost any guitar company can do about anything they set their mind to. Really, I mean, they're all using the same machines, and you know, craftsmen, and luthiers, and you know, everything's based off the same basic original designs. Sure. You know, everything's a, a version of a... Something built in the 50s or something. Or a Gibson yeah, yeah. or a couple other things. That's about it. What else are you going to do? Yeah. Uh, I mean, at least PRS came up with an in-between scale. Yeah. You know. But other than that, you know, there's not too many ways to reinvent the wheel. So, you know, I found somebody that, after some trial and error with other companies, actually, before I... I was with Area Pro 2, which was my first endorsement, which really wasn't much of an endorsement, but it was the first free guitar I got from a company. Yeah, so, so I that's played exciting, it. yeah. Yeah, it was, I was really excited to get that. And uh, then I uh, went to Kramer, and that really didn't work out. And then um, ESP did, you know, just because they were really attentive, and they rolled up their sleeves and we went to work. And in one day in Tokyo, we designed the Kamikaze, you know, together, put our heads together, and... Um, and it worked, you know, they did it, and it was, it's, it's a great design, I think, that sort of fills a, a void, you know. It isn't a Les Paul, it isn't a Strat, but it, it's not a Charvel, it's just kind of Something its own thing, yeah. yeah. It either filled a space or created a space that it then filled, whatever you want to call it, but, you know, it's definitely kind of a unique, kind of its own unique thing, and, and I was proud of that, and the fact that they were able to pull that off, and, um, so uh, we had a personal re great wonderful relationship as well um my guitar tech uh was my main guitar tech in the 80s uh and our best friends and we still are and um so uh when we went to japan together we worked on designing the guitar with the sp guys and then uh and matt is his name and matt uh, you know matt you know matt yeah i think i should do yeah. yeah and uh so then um he wanted to get off the road and i i got him this job at sp i'm not saying a brag or anything i'm just saying it's yeah, just kind of a cool story together. yeah absolutely. it's a cool story that he became became the ceo yeah uh, which he's been like for 20 years now yeah. and the company has become very very successful and um I've been with them for 33 years, or something like that. And you know, Matt, the, you know, the best friends. He's uh, my middle daughter's godfather. Oh, that's awesome! Yeah. Uh, so there's a real personal relationship. You know, he's uh, been my best man at all my weddings and um, all my weddings. Yeah. Like, sound good. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I mean? It's just yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, they're family. Yeah. So that's, I, I've always felt that that is such a great company. Um, I think I've been dealing with them for about 20 years uh, through different different channels, and uh, there was a guy named Mike Breaker. You probably know Mike oh, Breaker. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I love Mike. And, yeah. and he was a great guy, and yeah, we yeah. kind of, and we're close to the same age, so we came up kind of in the music industry together. And uh, as I rose in this side of it, he rose internally in ESP, and. Right. Uh, he, they're just such a great company and always kind of there to help us and they make great products and they stand behind them and, and the support for a music store is really important. I mean, if you, you walk around in here in stock, we have probably 2,000 guitars and uh, you don't want to deal with problems and, and quality control issues and they're just great. I mean, that guitar right there that you picked up is fresh out of the box and you're playing it. And I was kid with him. I said, when I, when I retire from touring and stuff, I'm going to be an ESP rep. <laughs> and my favorite part of the world is is the Southwest. Okay, so, so you take that territory. I'll, well, you know, I'll kick some some. I'm sure already has it, so I'll have to just wait in line. <laughs> I just kind of joke and pipe dream thing. But I th always thought, well, if I was the rep, I think I could do a really good job uh, at being a rep because um, I'm not sure it's, uh, all is involved, but uh, as far as the ESP guitars. I would go into the stores and just hang out with the salesmen and the people that work there and own it and develop a rapport, obviously, sit around and jam at the store so that I'd kind of, you know, yeah, yeah. make Get it people real. excited and, and, you know. And then talk to the salesmen about, you know, and, the, and if they have an in-house guy or whatever setting up guitars and make sure that they're all set up. Perfectly, yeah. Yeah, so that when they, you know, because that's every, to me, that's kind of like. Sure, when you I pull a guitar off the wall, 
it, it, instantly it's got a feel right. You never say, oh, well, I could buy this guitar, but I'm going to have to spend a day tweaking it, or I'm going to have to take it to a repair guy and make sure I can get it right. When you pick up a guitar, you're like, oh, yeah, this is the one for me. Yeah, this feels great. Not everybody can get past a bad setup. Yeah. You know? yeah. So you could take a mediocre guitar and get a great setup. Does it feel better than a... Uh, you know, a very expensive guitar with a, a lousy oh. setup. So <laughs> I think you can go a long way with that. And then um, also have a rig in every store that's very complimentary to the the guitar to make it, you know, right. sort of help sell the guitar. I remember there was a place I used to go in Hollywood, they're not in business anymore, called Voltage Guitar, and a lot of vintage stuff. And uh, they had a lot of high end clients and stuff. And, and you'd go in there and, you know, you pick up a you know, 60s SG or, uh, you know, old 50s Strat or whatever the telly, and, you, and, and their demo amp was a, a 5E3, you know, 56 or something deluxe, a 55, 56 tweed deluxe, yeah. which cannot sound bad, yeah. you know. Yeah. And, they, and they had it in this room with the wood floors, and it was just they had it in the right room. Oh, so natural reverberation. And well, everything was there. It's just, it just the, the amp would sell the, the guitar. Yeah. So they would refuse to sell that amp, and they told me, Tom Petty and Keith Richards tried to buy that amp because I inquired about buying it. They, we wouldn't even sell it to them. Why would we sell it to you? <laughs> yeah. So uh, uh, they go, that amp has sold us so many guitars. Oh, I totally believe that. Yeah. 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 I mean, that, that's such a big thing, especially um, I always get in like when I see somebody grab a guitar, you know, a nice guitar, and then they go plug it into the $89, you know, crate practice amp, and it's kind of like, what are you doing? What are you doing? If you just, I mean, Having a nice amp set up to play a nice guitar through, especially in the same genre, uh, is makes such a big difference. Yeah, and it depends on the buyer too. I mean, or the customer, or the person looking at the guitar. I mean, if you're buying a guitar like this Kamikaze, this Kami Four, you're obviously in a certain genre of music. You're sure, not, you're not. Sure, you're not playing, playing jazz. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, playing Brad Paisley licks or, right. you know, you're not playing the gypsy jazz or anything. You're probably playing. Rock, yeah. rock guitar, yeah. right. Yeah. So then you have a rig though that, that can, you know, be sort of fluid and you could do that that thing, have a little delay on it maybe, yeah. or a little yeah. bit of verb and you know, nice quality harmonic distortion with enough gain to where it's like giving you what you want. Yeah, good sustain, you can hit harmonic really easy, and it just rings out and Yeah, that'll help sell the guitar. Yeah. All right. I think you should be an ESP, right? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how much that pays in the thing. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like a lot of work too. Huh? Yeah, it is a lot of work. Maybe probably. I won't do that. Maybe. Uh, so while we're talking Maybe I'll just about be a rock star. Yeah, there you go. That's, that's pretty good. I think I'd rather have that job. While we're talking about the kamikaze, can you tell me what the writing is on there? What what does it say? My name is George and I have many children. Really? Well that's what some person told me, but I don't know if that's true because I can't, <laughs> can't quantify that or, okay. or double check with you because I don't really know Chinese characters. But that's what you, you're told that it is, okay? Yeah, some, somebody told me that and somebody else told me something else. It was just like maybe kind of an ideation of Mr. Scary or something, which sounds like probably more probable. But, okay. uh, All right. Well, I always wondered that. It's kind yeah, because of <laughs> there's three kinds of lettering in, in Japanese. In the Japanese language, is the little baby letters that they learn when they're first in you know grade school. There's kanji, which I, I think is just kind of the language they use just generically, like for government use or newspapers. And then there's the Chinese character, which is more artistic and, and isn't it's a total different kind of language where the symbols uh, represent an idea. Okay. There's so there's nothing phonetic in there. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, what's the significance of the five bombs? Six was too many and four wasn't enough. I have no <laughs> significance that I can think of. <laughs> All right. Well, that's interesting. Okay. All right. Um, so I was going to hit you with a couple just kind of rapid fire questions to just learn a little bit about you and, and kind of what's going on with you. So um, uh, I know we've got to get to sound check soon. So if mm -hmm. you want, we can just knock some of these things out. Sure. I know uh, kind of the idea of this interview is hopefully we inspire some folks to uh, pick up the guitar, play. I know. Uh, me as a fan, I'm always intrigued by uh, learning more about your practice routine, your habits, what you think about. Yeah, I, I basically you know? I practice during podcasts. That's <laughs> my thing. Yeah. So I have to do a lot of podcasts yeah, to, keep, to get keep better. Yeah, practicing. Yeah, so if you if you're, you're learning new things. I don't even like doing podcasts. I just like you know you like practicing. practicing. Yeah, and it's a nice quiet time that you could you could practice. So, what are you currently listening to? 
and, and I don't mean like, I know you probably get a question all the time, who are your influences, who are your favorite bands? Like, what did you listen to today here in the car? What, what do you like when I you get on the plane? I didn't anything today. Yesterday I listened to this guy, Gustavo Brazil. Okay, I'm not uh, familiar with him. Brazilian. Um, uh, Neo jazz, everything kind of guy. Um, I got turned on to him by um, the guys from Animals Leaders. Okay. So I did some work with um, the rhythm guitar player. Well, I don't want to call him a rhythm guitar player, but, you know. <laughs> the second guitar yeah. player, we'll say, okay. Yeah. Okay. They, turn, they turn me on to him, and it's just, just ridiculously fascinating guitar player. But, you know, there's so much stuff out on the internet now that I've found that um, I, I just, a lot of times, spend a lot of time just on Instagram or something, or, you know, Facebook just kind of going through, uh, like, some of the sites like Sound of Guitar. Okay. Have you seen that one? I haven't, no. You know, it's just, just every day there's, like, five, six different people, you know, guys sending little clips. All kinds of great stuff, you know, just uh, great rockabilly players and yeah. and then blues guys and just like R and B soul kind of vibe and just like great inversions and great technique, and, you know, really cool mellow tone. Or you get some mellow guys, of course, doing all that. Just crazy stuff, and I'm just like, man, it's always inspiring to come around yeah. with that. And, yeah. and especially in different genres and different styles of music. You Mateo know? Astusa, I don't know if you know that guy. No. Um, he's looking pretty nuts. There, there's, I've come to realize that there are so many awesome players out there, and, and with the with the dawn of Facebook and YouTube and Instagram and, and just the internet in general, you see these guys, and they're just everyday guys or girls mm -hmm. that are amazing. There's actually like a humongous uh, influx of shredding women guitar players mm -hmm. nowadays. I mean, I think uh, Nita Strauss, I don't know if you, you follow her. Mm -hmm. yeah, she, yeah, she's amazing. I mean, she's a great guitar player. Um, uh, there's another guy that I'm always watching on Facebook, Rick Graham. Have you seen him? Mm -hmm. uh, he's really great. And he, he is phenomenal. And uh, let's see, Liquid Charlie's another one who's kind of... I mean, I grew up in an era where, you know, you could name the guys on one hand. Yeah. You know, or maybe two if you really went deep, you know. Yeah. But that was about it. Now and, there's and, so much yeah. stuff out there. It's like information yeah. overload, not which is music with everything. Yeah. You know? It, uh, it just becomes overwhelming at some point. I'm just like, mm, nothing special anymore. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, that's the other thing, too, is I think that this era doesn't have the same kind of rock star celebrity that there was before because everybody has instant access to everybody and everything. You can see, you know, I, I remember going to concerts and you didn't know what the set was going to be. So if you threw in a cool kind of, uh, you know, song that you didn't play a lot, you were like, oh my God, you know, they played that song. But now, even if I don't want to see it, I see clips of the show. I see the set list printed online. I mean, I think uh, th there's, there's nothing is held back anymore, so it takes that excitement away. Kind of a weird mm -hmm. thing, a little bit, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain, because the curtain doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's exactly it. It's, uh, it you know, I don't want to start sounding like the old man. It's just like, you know. I feel like I'm sounding like the old man yeah, back yeah, in my day. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I think that's a natural thing, you know, for every generation to kind of surplant the one previous to it. And yeah. build, you know, on the shoulders of their predecessors. That's what we're designed to do. Um, there's a reason for that. So, you know. Uh, and then we always think that, you know, the next generation doesn't have a clue, but they do. They're actually a lot smarter than us. Yeah, and, yeah. and they learn from <laughs> our mistakes and see where we fell short of something and take the ball that much farther down the road kind of thing, you know. That's uh, what they do. <laughs> and then they get older and become like us, yeah. jaded. Yeah, and yeah. <laughs> Man, back in my day, you didn't know. <laughs> so what are your current musical goals? Well, uh, I mean, concretely, I would like to do those. Uh, uh, an Ashtel guitar instrumental record. I've never done one. I did, you know, Sacred Groove in 1993 was partly instrumental, uh, but I'd like to do that magnum opus thing where I just would shed and go deep and spend a year and yeah. create this real personal musical statement. You know, okay. Uh, that kind of maybe sums it all up. And, and secondly, you know, just keep chasing that dragon in my head, you know. I never seem to be able to. It's so elusive, you know. Yeah. That, that, that 
the world's greatest song, the world's greatest guitar solo, you know. Sure, the best riff ever, you yeah, know. That's like, like, you know yeah. Oh shit. Yeah, yeah. And I've never actually come up with anything that's as good as that. Uh, you gotten pretty close a lot of times, so. <laughs> yeah, but if you hear what's going on here, it's just crazy, and it happens, you know, in the crazy, and for all of us that are players, you know, we, we all share this uh, experience, I'm sure, as uh, everybody I talk to, it's like, yeah, man, so I'm in the shower, I'm riding my motorcycle, or I'm in the car, yeah. or just when I'm waking up, or if I'm in a certain room, like there's a bathroom downstairs next to my studio that, where I can hear like there's some kind of pipes or air conditioning or something going on behind the walls, and it creates this drone. It's very, very subtle, Yeah. but I always hear Beats and, and, and yeah, melodies. So you find yourself creating melody lines over top of it and kind of yeah. like humming along, doing what you're doing. I do so when I'm working day. in the studio, they're like, where are you going? I go, hey, oh, sure, go. the bathroom a lot. I go, no, 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 I go for inspiration because <laughs> all my ideas are in the, in the, in the can. <laughs> so what, uh, tell me a little bit about your practice routine other than when you're doing podcasts. Do, do you, like today, uh, you're doing a clinic. I know tomorrow you're playing M3. Uh, what do you do to prepare for these gigs? Do, do you practice every day? Do you like you know sometimes I'll pick a piece of music and say all right you know this month I'm gonna work on whatever solo this is and, and learn every note and, and you know be perfect at it or I'm gonna work on sweet picking what do you do to, to stay up to par I'm not that methodical I and mean, disciplined I uh, basically did a, did a try to keep the guitar in my hands that's about the as low as the bar goes for me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. you know, I just keep my fingers moving and uh, and stay well lubed <laughs> you know, mentally and physically, and uh, um, I'm not a disciplined um, practicer. I I, I, um, I know I should be, and I'm a better guitar player when I am. So I would, you know, highly recommend it. Yeah. Uh, you know, I was doing a clinic yesterday. I was talking to everybody, and I was remembering it. You know, when I used to teach uh, in various places throughout my you know years as a guitar player. That's always when I was my best, you know. Sure. So just I, I being in the saddle way. and playing, you know. I mean, whether it's applying yourself, which is obviously the best way to do it, is you know, have a book in front of you or study something or really try to get outside your box. That's always the best thing. But just to at least be in the saddle and keeping your fingers moving and trying to get, trying to stretch beyond what you know the default is. Yeah. You know, because that default thing is just a trap. You yeah. know. Yeah. But yet necessary, you know, because you need an anchor. You need some place to start, but then when you just keep going down that same well-worn path, and you're just digging a rut, and then yeah, and it's the same thing. And, and, and you're not inspired because you're like, oh man, well, I'm just not even thinking here, and I already played that, and that sounds fine. And you know, um, do you have any tips that you would give to up-and-coming guitar players, uh, other than keep the guitar in your hands? Um, I always tell people that if they could pick up the guitar every day and play, even if it's for 10 or 15 minutes, um, that they'll become a better player, that they'll be more comfortable with the instrument, that they'll just kind of develop a better ear. Do you have any advice other than that? that you I, I would say uh, maybe a good piece of advice is to handicap yourself. You know, um, acoustic guitar with heavy strings. Uh, I knew a guy that always tuned, uh, tuned his practice guitars up to F. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's, you know, it's just to make it more challenging. There was another thing I used to practice, which I should probably start doing again, is folding fingers back behind, taking a finger out of the equation on your left hand. So playing this two, three, and four, and taking your index finger out of it, or just two, just two fingers. Okay. And you're trying to run your scales and your, your modes and triads and stuff with just two or three fingers. You know, things like that. Just whatever handicap you can think of. I mean, I just stood off the top of my head, but I used to always say to myself, "Okay, like let's say, for example." I'm on stage at Nissan Pavilion with Lynch Mob, and I have to take the solo, but I can only use these two strings. What do you do? And kind of compose a melody line or a cool lick mm -hmm. or something like that. And uh, uh, you'd be surprised how hard it is when you really put your mind to something like that and not be repetitive and not mm -hmm. be boring and generic kind of thing. I got great advice, I probably some of the best advice I ever got from uh, Elliot from The Cars. And uh, he said, uh, he gave me three pieces of advice, but the one that really stuck with me was uh, when you are in the studio and you're composing or you're writing a song or, or a guitar line, sing it. I just Don't play on guitar. Just sing it, you know, hear where it should go in your head, and then just mimic it with guitar. Yeah. 
So it's and like a vocal melody line, something yeah, you can come back. Yeah, and, um, uh, I guess. And then the other thing was, uh, uh, so it's more of a talking guitar part rather than, you know, sure. uh, guitar phrasing from a guitar phrasing standpoint. And then uh, the other thing you said was, uh, uh, if you're constructing a solo or, a, you know, whatever kind of part in a song and you're doing a, a, a harmony to it, uh, okay, do that harmony and then strip out the fundamental and leave the harmony in the solo. If you're like comping the solo or something. Wow, okay. This is interesting stuff. That That's challenging. Very useful. Yeah, <laughs> that is pretty useful yeah. information. Um, are you still into fitness? I know one time you were a really big fitness guy. Oh, no, no, I'm just... You know, try to eat right, uh, try to stay active in various ways. And, uh, but yeah, no, not like it used to be. I mean, it was, that was what, uh, back in the day, it was like that was my main thing. Yeah. Was being in the gym and the guitar was secondary and that wasn't healthy in a lot of ways. Really? Okay. Yeah, like and how, how do you control your diet and eat right, especially when you travel? Yeah, as much a lot of effort, do. right? It really does. It really yeah. consumed all my time. Was, you know, getting to gyms and, 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 and unfamiliar cities and getting my diet right and, and, and managing that, that, you know, it was just ridiculous. And guitar was just something that was kind of got in my way. I'd have to go out there and knock <laughs> yeah, that out of yeah, there. Yeah, exactly. Back to the gym. Yeah, it's like you go, yeah, it's like you go. <laughs>
if it wouldn't have been for that, it, I wouldn't be playing in a parking lot today. <laughs> I had to pay my dues and play those stupid arenas and stuff. You know, like, um, yeah, monsters of parking lot. Yeah, so, anyways, yes, sir. You don't want to know, dude. <laughs> but let me guarantee you, you're not going to ask me for a pick afterwards. <laughs> no, I just fold it between my fingers. And it's sort of an unconscious move, and I'm not really a true finger picker, like, you know, flat pickers or anything like that. I use two, uh, yeah, just kind of like a claw thing. You know? I would like to learn to use another finger, you know, get that technique down, but, <clears throat> yeah. Actually, I actually prefer to have um, a, a hum in the bridge and a single in the neck, but just a lot of my guitars just end up being built this way, you know what I mean? Like, for instance, this guitar, it would destroy the, the routing and everything, the pattern to have put a single in there. Um, but that has single in it, you know, and I love it because, you know, you want to do something a little more legato fluid, it's there, you know, and I love that. But. Uh, I don't know. It's just the one trick Charvel, you know, San Dimas kind of thing. It's what we all grew up with and it's kind of what we default to. Oh, favorite, favorite guitar. My favorite guitar right now is the one that I'm holding in my hand. Um, I mean, it changes, you know, from week to week. Um, and I always end up going back to my first love, right? Which is, you know, the stuff we start out with. So. Um, my Tiger is pretty much my default favorite, my original Tiger guitar. Although all my guitars have a, you know, have a soft spot for all of them, depending on what I'm doing, right? And if I'm playing in this context or maybe another different project I have, which requires me to be, I have different, uh, different tone palette, different sounds available. Sometimes I go to a Strat, uh, you know, my, I have a homemade Strat. It's not a real Fender, but um, I got a 50, I just acquired a 59 Les Paul Jr. So, you know, when I want to pretend to be Leslie West, I'll pull that out, you know. <laughs> so, you know, it's just, it's one th nice thing about having multiple guitars. People ask me, why do you have so many, you know, we had this conversation earlier today. Do we really need all these guitars? But in a sense, when you do this for a living and it's your whole life, it does keep it interesting and you got to keep it interesting. Otherwise, it, dude, it really can get stale, you know. I mean, for me, I've really never experienced that, but I know a lot of guitar player friends of mine and uh, have expressed that, you know. Um, and, and for me, I'm a tone junkie and a gear junkie, so I'm just totally tone questing all the time. And to me, that's the adventure beyond just the playing and writing and composing and performing. It's, it's, it's like when I'm out here, like I'm in my hotel, what do we do? You know, we look up, uh, we look up, try to look up music stores, if we ever have time, if we have a day off or something, first thing we do is look up music, mom and pop music stores like this place and go trolling for old, cool little pieces of gear, pedals, you know, whatever, amps, you know. Not necessarily expensive stuff, just kind of cool, trippy stuff that's fun, you know, and take it home and play with it. And it really keeps the, uh, keeps the juices flowing, if you know what I mean.
just spent an hour and a half rocking out with you outside in our parking lot. I didn't see you rocking out. I was totally rocking out. Oh, that's because you were behind me. I was behind you, but I was just freaking out about, you know, the event itself. Yeah, but, it was uh, it was interesting and fun, and, and it took me a second to get acclimated, and that's the thing with these, with these clinics, which are... Uh, you know, in all kinds of different locations a lot of times and and uh, For me, it's all about hearing how it how it sounds sure. and, and, and the feedback loop and I have to get acclimated So that's why I won't I need to get out on the stage and I do this when we play live as well I get out on the stage and um, Sort of get a feel for it and make sure my rigs all right and when I get all the all the things worked out with my rig You know which pedal to use what cabinets the settings and everything then I start getting tuned into the stage itself in the room to where I feel comfortable with it and um, and it makes it a lot easier to, to play well. And, and tonight, um, I was struggling at first uh, because it was so, a strange environment, you know, so sure, the acoustics sure. were, were weird. It was kind of I was sort of disconnected and I was trying to find a balance between my tracks and my and my guitar sound and the subs and then playing outside with the buildings and it was just setting up kind of a yeah totally you know some weird reflections and i had to just sometimes honestly if you just move uh you can find sweet spots on the stage if you can just move even your head over a few inches sometimes it changes everything yeah you're in the direct field of a monitor or you hear your mm -hmm. amp just enough to to uh, kind of play off of that or, or exactly. feeds back just the right way. You're trying to create yeah. a mix in an environment where you can forget about thinking about all that and just start playing. And right. I got there about halfway through, two thirds of the way through. Well, to from the outside looking in, to us, the audience, and me as a musician, you got there super quick. Hmm. I mean, I, I think uh, um, it, it's, it's definitely a strange environment and being thrown in there with somebody you're not used to running your sound gear you're not used to mm -hmm. that's a tough thing yeah but uh i'm adaptable and i'm really i'm all about the throw and go i, I i'm good with that um I'm, I'm, i've got really good basic gear so i know my, my sound is there um it's just kind of working it out you know gig by gig yeah totally. you know so totally, i get that and sometimes it's it's, it's really a, a it's a head game you know, a lot of it is just psychological. A lot of it is because I'm, I'm capable <laughs> yeah. of playing. You yeah, know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you played these songs before, so you, you know what to expect. You've heard the track before. I really rely almost entirely on inspiration. So. And I thought it was awesome. You played our store guitar, fresh out of the box. For yeah, the first I loved it. Three songs. That's amazing. I loved it. I mean, I was playing it in here when we were talking earlier, and uh, just without it plugged in, and it, the neck on it feels great. I felt right at home. I thought, well, as long as this thing's got a decent pickup in it, uh, it should be okay. It's a nice piece of wood. I mean, what could go wrong? It, it sounds wonderful. <laughs> that, that's actually a really good testament to ESP, that you could do that. You, um, know? you know, I do that, well, not frequently, frequently, but now and again I, I have done that. I pulled things off the wall and just played them. And, and very rarely ever regretted it. You know, it kind of goes back to the setup. As long as it's set up, fine. Good to go. Well, I... Uh, I appreciate everything that you've done for us today, and you are my very first podcast guest ever. Oh, really? Uh, so oh, this is you. kind of a new thing for me, and you've made this super easy and uh, welcoming and awesome, so thank you're, you very much for that. A, you're a good interviewer, whatever your Am I? title <laughs> is. I don't know what you're called, but <laughs> I'm DJ, just a fan. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, the clinic, Yeah, podcatist. The, the clinic was awesome. I think uh, mm -hmm. just looking at, at the looks on our customers' faces was awesome. We've had people buy in. Uh, George Lynch guitars weeks leading up to this. Mm. We've had tons and tons of phone calls and emails. Uh, so thank you very much for that oh, and everything man. that you've done. And, I've been uh, part of the ESP family for 33 years, and so I'm always, you know, they've been in family to me. So I'm, I'm, when they say jump, I say how high. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm glad to be here and uh, I enjoyed myself. And actually, it was great practice for me because. A lot of times I'd just be sitting in my hotel room being lazy and not practicing when I should. This well, there you go. So this me. is forcing you to practice. Yes. Anytime you want to practice, you call me. We'll do another okay. episode or something. Uh, is there anything that you want to leave our listeners and our customers with? Um, you know, it, it's awesome having you in our store and having you in our local town. Is there any thoughts that you can give about our store, about our customers, about inspirational things to keep people playing? Anything you want to leave us with? Hmm. Well, I, I just maybe leave with a more of a universal, not particularly musical uh, observation and just say that, you know, a place like this is sort of a, 
a, a temple of normalcy in the crazy world that we live in right now because music is that thing that sort of levels all the playing fields. That's it. And so uh, with all the polarization and, 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 and shittiness that's going on right now in the world, uh, it's nice to have a place where we, where we all come together and all those things just seem to, just to dissolve. That's, so, that is a, that's a great this ending. This is kind of like my church. <laughs> there you go. That's, that's exactly it. Well, again, thank you very much. Um, I can't say that enough. Uh, it's been an awesome experience, and uh, we wish you luck tomorrow at M3 Festival, and uh, hopefully we'll catch you next time when you're back in Maryland. Yeah, we'll play playing a whole 45 minutes, but oh well. <laughs> you know, we'll get up there and hit it hard and fast and furious and get in and get out. But thank you. Yeah, absolutely. All right.